Hello and welcome to Lost Love Chronicles. Mike Johnson wondered what he would find when he finally reached the home he shared with his wife, Amy, a woman he had not heard from for over a year, even though she knew where he was. As he stared out the window of the cab, he thought back over his life. He lost both his parents at the age of 17 in a tragic auto accident and became an emancipated minor with the support of his next-door neighbor, who happened to be a county social worker. Fortunately, his parents had set up a trust fund to make sure he was well taken care of. It wasn't a huge amount of money, but it was enough to take care of his needs. He was also in great physical shape and played football in high school. He was popular with his classmates because he had his own house, which was paid for with his inheritance, and he was considered to be an all-around nice guy. His father taught him to be a gentleman to the ladies and how to control his temper. When he died, he was a hand-to-hand -hand combat instructor and had taught Mike well. He graduated high school and went to college at the University of Florida. In his third year of college, he met Amy, who was in her second year. They dated a few times, but he felt like something was missing, so he didn't call her after their third date. About two weeks later, she called. Hey, Mike, she said. What's going on? I haven't heard from you for a while. Is something wrong? I don't know, Amy, he said. I just don't think we're a good fit, you know? That's not true, Mike, she said, disappointed. I think we're a great fit. Please, can we try again? Okay, let me think about it, he said. A week later, he asked her out again. This date was completely different. They had had sex on their original dates, but this time was so much better. Wow, baby, that was great, he said after a mind-blowing orgasm. Where did you learn to do all that? And who did you practice with? Amy laughed. My roommate gave me some tips, she said. They continued dating until he graduated with a degree in economics. As they celebrated his graduation that night, he asked her to marry him, and she said yes. The wedding was set to take place after her graduation. He stayed in the area so he could remain close to Amy and got a job with a local investment firm. They married in March 2001. At the time, he was 22 and Amy was 21. Things were going great for them, but the world changed that September. On September 12, 2001, he joined the army. Thanks in large part to his father's training and his constant practice of martial arts, he became a ranger. During this time, they made a great couple and were happy newlyweds. He kept the house he had inherited from his parents in Columbus, and the two stayed there. Amy was able to get a job as a paralegal in town. By the time his training was complete, the U.S. was neck deep in Iraq, and he was shipped off for a 12-month tour. A month into that tour, he was promoted to sergeant and made a squad leader. After that tour, he came home but nine months later was ordered to Iraq for another 12-month tour. By now, he had re-enlisted and was promised a duty station of his choice upon returning from Iraq. Predictably, Amy wasn't happy. Why do you have to go back? She asked. I need you here with me. I'm sorry, he said. I've been given orders. I want to stay here with you, too, but I don't have a choice in the matter. He held her as she cried into his shoulder. After this tour, I'm supposed to be able to choose my next assignment, he told her, hoping it was a promise he would be able to keep. They made love well into the morning. What Mike didn't know is that would be the last time he would be with her sexually. Three days later, he was in Iraq. For the first month, he got a letter from Amy every other day. He called when he could and always wrote back. But after that first month, he received only one letter in the next six months and had only been able to talk to her two times on the phone. What the hell was going on, he wondered. After nearly eight months with virtually no contact from Amy, he was worried but couldn't do anything about it. So he did what many others did and counted the days until his tour was finished. On a Tuesday morning, his Humvee hit an IED, killing four of the soldiers in the vehicle. As a result of the blast, he lost his lower left leg. Three hours after the attack, a chopper was able to land and evacuate all the casualties. They patched his leg up as best they could and sent him to Ramstein, Germany for more surgeries and rehab. After spending three months in Germany, he was shipped to Walter Reed Hospital for more surgery, more rehab, and a prosthetic limb. It took an extra two months to learn how to walk with his prosthetic. Afterward, he was given a medical discharge and released to go home. Despite his best efforts, he heard nothing from his wife. By now, it had been more than a year since he had any contact with her at all. Was she even alive, he asked himself. And if she was, why the hell didn't she contact him? He had tried calling her parents but wasn't able to get any answers. He called his home and left messages. At least he still had power at his house, so someone must be there. It was about 9.30 a.m. when the taxi pulled up in front of the house where they lived. His truck was still in the driveway along with her car. 
He also noticed several other cars parked along the curb. The cab driver helped him carry his duffel bag to the door after he extracted his large 6-foot 2-inch frame out of the small car. He heard noises from the front room and wondered what was going on. He carefully opened the door and walked into the living room, where he got the shock of his life. There, on the floor, was a barely recognizable Amy being gang-banged by six men. He took out his cell phone and began taking pictures of the action before him. The men screwing her heard the door open and saw the flash from his phone and looked up. After seeing him standing there, they grabbed their clothes and ran out the door. Mike recognized them as he had seen them on base before, and two of the men had rotated to the States when he arrived in Iraq for his second tour. Amy laid on the floor. Not recognizing him, she actually asked if he wanted to turn since the others had left. Are you kidding me? He shouted. So, this is what you've been doing the last 13 months? Is this why you couldn't bother to write or answer my calls? I get myself blown off and lose a leg, and here you are screwing everyone in town? Get the hell out of my house. You have 10 minutes to pack up and get the hell out. That's when she recognized him. She got off the floor and reached out to him, but he backed off. Keep your filthy cheating paws off me, you witch, he ordered. She backed away from him, scared. Please, Mike, let me explain, she begged. This isn't what you think. Are you kidding me right now? He asked. I haven't heard shit from you for over a year, and when I do get home, I find you getting banged on the floor by six men. There's nothing to explain. Pack your trash and get out. After saying that, he had another thought. He went to their bedroom and pulled her clothes out of the closet, including her wedding dress, and tossed them out the window. Going to her purse, he pulled out the ATM card for their joint account and the credit card they shared. He also took the house key off her key ring. He went outside, pulling out his lighter. What are you doing? Amy asked, scared. You have 10 minutes to pack your trash and leave or I'm burning everything, he said. Now move. Amy ran through the house, trying to get her things together. Mike kept track of the elapsed time on his watch. She got the last item off the ground just as Mike was getting ready to set it on fire. Where will I go? She asked through her tears. Right now, I don't give a flying shit, he said. As far as I'm concerned, you can go and rot in hell. Just tell me where you're staying so I'll know where to send the divorce papers. Please, Mike, you have to believe me. This is the only time it's ever happened. It was an accident. It didn't mean anything, she pleaded. Mike, however, wasn't buying it. Bullshit, which he said. I haven't heard from you in months. What I saw in that house definitely wasn't the first time for you. I may have been born at night, but it wasn't last night. Now go, goddammit. Amy sobbed as she pulled out of the driveway and left. Mike watched as she left and went back in the house, devastated. By now, he was exhausted, physically and emotionally, and collapsed on the couch, his leg hurting. He couldn't believe what she had done to him. He lost track of time, and before he knew it, the sun was beginning to set. He got up and looked around the kitchen, hoping to find something to eat, when the phone rang. Hello, he said, answering the phone. Mike, what the hell is wrong with you? Asked an angry female voice on the other end. He recognized it as Julie, Amy's older sister. Why did you kick Amy out of the house? Ask her, Mike said. Have her tell you why. I did, she said. She said you didn't like the way the house looked and told her to get out. That's bullshit, Julie, and I think you know it, Mike said. If you want the truth, come by my house and I'll show you. He heard nothing on the other end for a few moments. Okay, Mike, I'll come by, but this had better be good, she said before hanging up. He knew it would be a while before she got to his house, so he sat down at his computer and turned it on. After it finished booting up, he decided to check Amy's email. Amy wasn't too bright about things like passwords, and she had one of those web-based email services, so he was in her email in pretty short order. He decided to slow Amy down a bit and changed her password so she couldn't delete anything. He knew that eventually, she would get it reset but not before he had his evidence. It only took him a few minutes of browsing her emails to realize this had been going on for quite some time, perhaps during his entire tour in Iraq. The emails he saw were quite explicit, and many of them had pictures or video attached. Hey, cutie. One email read, Had a great time last night. You're one hot woman. The email had two pictures attached, so he brought them up and printed them out. The pictures showed Amy with men having sex. The email was dated one week after he left for Iraq. There were many, many more just like this. Just wait till your stupid hick husband comes back, another email read. We'll give him a hot welcoming party lol. That email had a video showing Amy getting plugged in all her holes at the same time. That email was dated the day he was wounded in Iraq. 
By the time Julie showed up, he had printed off nearly a ream of emails and a large pile of photos. The videos were saved into a folder. He noticed the same six men were featured in most of the photos and videos. He answered the door, making sure Julie was alone. She didn't look very happy. All right, Mike, spill it. What's going on? She asked, her face red with anger. He pulled out his phone and showed her the pictures. This is what I walked into when I got home, he said. Her face turned white as she looked at the photos he had taken. Oh my God. There's more, he said, throwing down the pictures he had taken from Amy's email. Julie looked through the photos, shocked. Did you know about all this? She shook her head. God's honest truth. I had no idea. I knew she was going out a lot, but I didn't know about this. She never said anything to you? Mike asked. Julie shook her head. No, nothing. My God, Mike, I'm so sorry. I knew she was upset about you leaving, but I didn't think she'd do this. Did she say anything to you about me being wounded? He asked. Julie shook her head. Wounded? Julie asked, surprised. When did you get wounded? About six months ago, he said. Lost part of a leg. I've been in surgery and rehab for months, and I never heard anything from her. Now I know why. I'm sorry, Mike. She never said anything about it. She's hardly mentioned you at all over the last several months. Probably too busy getting drilled to even give a damn. She didn't even recognize me when I came in the door. So what are you going to do? Julie asked. I'm divorcing her. Is there any way you can forgive her and work past this? You gotta be kidding me. There's no way I can ever get past this. And something tells me I'm just scratching the tip of the iceberg. No, we're finished. I understand, Mike. I'm really very sorry about all this. I'm going to give her a piece of my mind when I see her. She wrapped her arms around him. If there's anything I can ever do, let me know, okay? She asked before leaving. Thanks, Julie. I appreciate that, he said. He locked the door after she left and went back to the computer to see what else he could dig up. By the time the clock struck midnight, he had printed off all of the incriminating emails and saved hundreds of photos and videos. Looking at the timeline, he could see that Amy's cheating had begun early in his first tour in Iraq and had been happening about once a week the whole time he was gone. He also managed to identify all six men involved in her gangbangs. He also learned that all of them were active duty. Based on what they wrote, he was able to identify the units they belonged to and got an idea of the days they went out clubbing. Additionally, he found that all six of the men Amy had been screwing were married and a couple of them had young children. He made a note of their addresses and contact information. He regretted that they would be hurt in all this, but he wasn't going to let the a-holes off the hook just because they had children. He filed that information away and laid down on the futon in his office to get a few hours sleep. The next day would be very busy. He woke up before the sun came up the next day and did his morning routine. Getting dressed, he mapped out the day's activities. First on his list was to get an appointment with a good divorce attorney. He looked through the phone book and started making calls. After speaking to a couple of firms, he was able to get an appointment that morning. Looking at his watch, he realized he didn't have a lot of time before the appointment so he went to the bank and closed out their joint accounts and reopened an account in his name only. He knew he would probably have to give her half of their money, so he got a cashier's check for the full amount. His inheritance and trust fund were in accounts that Amy had no access to, so he left those alone. He closed out their joint credit card and applied for one in his name only, paying off the balance on the other card. Once done, he headed out to see his attorney. He walked in, carrying a folder full of emails and photos, and checked in with the receptionist. He had just poured a cup of coffee when an attractive woman came out from the back and introduced herself. Mr. Johnson, she asked, extending her hand. He shook her hand and introduced himself. Please call me Mike, he said. She smiled and ushered him into her office. Thank you, Mike. Please call me Sally. I understand you are seeking a divorce, is that right? Yes, it is, he said. She looked at him hard for a few minutes. You know, I don't represent cheating spouses, she said. Mike put the folder on her desk. Sally, I've been in Iraq and in the hospital recovering from combat wounds for several months. Am not the one cheating, as these emails and photos show. She looked at the folder, picked it up and thumbed through the thick pile of papers, shaking her head. Oh my, this is extremely incriminating. How did you get these emails and photos? Well, my soon-to-be ex-wife used my computer for her correspondence, and they like to send photos and video back and forth. You have video as well? She asked. Yes, I do. And I came home to this yesterday. He pulled out his phone and showed her the photos he took in his house. Her eyes grew wide. 
They went over the evidence and the details of the divorce and by the time the meeting was over, Sally agreed to file for divorce on the grounds of adultery, naming the six men she'd been screwing for the last two years. So, once we file, we'll get her served and she'll have 30 days to respond. If she doesn't respond, we can have the final decree granted immediately. If she does contest it, it may take a bit longer. Since you owned the house before you got married, she has no claim on it. The same for your inheritance and your trust fund. If she wants to fight it, we can use the photos and video. Hopefully, she'll simply sign the papers and it'll be a done deal. We can have her served either at her work or at her sister's apartment if she's still there in a couple days. That would be great, Mike said. He thanked her and left the office, feeling better since he first got home the previous day. After he got home, he called the locksmith to have the locks changed on the house and began calling the wives of the men Amy had been involved with. Needless to say, they were all pissed. Most of them had suspected something was going on but didn't know what. They all asked for evidence, and Paul was more than happy to email photos and videos along with copies of some of their emails. He made a few more calls and met some of his comrades at a bar on the edge of town. They looked at some of the photos he brought and shook their heads. They also knew the six men involved and discussed possible options. As they talked, one of the six, a big clod named John Abrams, came stumbling into the bar. George, one of Mike's friends, pointed him out. They looked and turned back to their beer, but not before the a-hole recognized Mike and staggered over to him, full of piss and vinegar. Well, well, he said loudly, if it ain't Sergeant Johnson. How's your wife these days? She's still stretched out from my action, he asked, grabbing his crotch. Mike said nothing, prompting the a-hole to push the issue. What, are you a scumsucker as well as a cock? Come on, big ranger dude, let's see what you've got. He made the mistake of taking a swing at Mike, his fist glancing off the top of Mike's head. Mike responded, putting the a-hole down on the floor in seconds without breaking a sweat. Red with rage, he began pummeling the man's face, breaking his nose and leaving a few teeth on the floor. The next thing Mike knew, he was being pulled off the man by two police officers who slapped handcuffs on him and threw him in the back of a police cruiser. The other man was loaded into an ambulance and taken to an emergency room. Mike spent a few hours in jail before an officer came to his holding cell, waving him out. Today's your lucky day, soldier, the officer said. Witnesses said you acted in self-defense and surveillance video proved it, so you get to go home tonight with no charges. Mike went home and went to sleep. The next day, he got a call from one of his friends. Hey, did you see the news? George asked. No, I just got up. What's up? Seems there was a rash of muggings last night. Five soldiers ended up in the hospital with various injuries. It's in the paper. Isn't that a shame? Yeah, that's terrible news, Mike said sarcastically. Anyone we know? Yeah, they just so happen to be the other five guys screwing Amy. Isn't that quite a coincidence? Yeah, that is quite a coincidence, Mike said, smiling. Later that day, Mike got a visit from his former regimental commander and the sergeant major, a man who made Sam Elliott's character in We Were Soldiers look downright friendly by comparison. He opened the door and invited them in, offering them something to drink. No, thanks, sergeant, the colonel said. We just wanted to stop by for a few minutes to see how things are going. Could be better, all things considered, colonel, and please, call me Mike. I'm not a soldier anymore. Thanks to this, he added tapping on his prosthetic leg. I understand, and I do apologize, the colonel said. Not your fault, colonel. You didn't plant that IED. They all laughed at that. I understand you're going through a divorce. I got a call from your lawyer who said your wife's been involved with six active duty soldiers. That's right, colonel. I have names, addresses, you name it. You want them? Yes, uh, Mike, that would be helpful, the colonel said. Mike went into his office and brought out a folder. He handed the colonel a sheet with the men's names and addresses. Would you like pictures as well? Mike asked. I have pictures, video, you name it. Seems they got a kick out of emailing this stuff back and forth to each other. And yes, they knew she was my wife. They deliberately did it while I was overseas in a combat zone. And yes, they're all married. You've done your homework. I see, the colonel said. Yes, sir, I have. I've also done some checking online, and I know that adultery is covered under Article 134, Paragraph 62 of the Uniform Code of Military Justice. From what I've read, there's three basic elements of proof, and I believe all six of these cases meet those elements. I see. You may very well be right from what you've said and shown us here. I'll take a look at this and push it through JAG and see what they say. 
If they agree, I think we can make a case to have them all dishonorably discharged. Also, Colonel, one of them attacked me last night in a public bar. He ended up in the hospital. The Colonel nodded his head. Personally, I'd expect nothing less, but officially, you didn't hear that from me, he said, smiling. So, what are your plans for the future? Well, Colonel, I haven't had much time to think about that. I have an economics degree, but I don't think I'd ever be happy pushing a pencil again. The Colonel smiled. Why didn't you go for OCS? He asked. With your record, you would have been a shoe in My dad was an NCO, and I always wanted to be where the action was, Mike said. The colonel nodded his head, and the SGT Mosh smiled. I knew your dad when he was a hand-to-hand -hand combat instructor. Damn good man. I know he'd be proud of you no matter what you decide to do. He stood and put his hat back on. The SGT Mosh joined him. He extended his hand, and Mike shook it. You take care of yourself, Sergeant. If there's anything I can do, let me know. Mike nodded his head. Thank you, Colonel. S. Dimash, he said. He watched as the two men left. Mike spent the day puttering around the house, doing mostly busy work, just stuff to keep him from thinking about Amy. That evening, he popped open a beer and spent the night watching television, his mind wandering over his failed marriage. The next day, he got a call from someone at Amy's place of work, telling him that she had been served with divorce papers. Is it true? The female voice asked. Mike knew the voice. It was Amanda, one of Amy's friends at the law firm where she worked. He always thought she was quite attractive and had nice legs, but he never said anything. Is what true? Mike asked. That she cheated on you while you were in Iraq. The process server was very clear that she was being divorced for adultery. We all heard him. Yeah, it's true. It's been going on for over two years. And you never knew? Amanda asked. She only did it while I was deployed to Iraq, Mike told her. Oh my God, you poor man. I'm so sorry. Well, listen, sugar. If there's anything we can do for you, just call, okay? I do mean anything. We think the world of you, and we hate what she did to you. Thanks, Amanda. I appreciate that, Mike said. Later that day, he got a call from Linda Abrams, John Abrams' wife. Hey, Mike, you have a few minutes to talk? Yeah, sure. What's up? Well, I learned about what my a-hole of a husband did to you and Amy, and I'd like to get some revenge if you're up to it, she said. Mike smiled. He knew Linda and thought she was a beautiful woman. He couldn't understand why John would cheat on her. He listened to her plan and had to smile. This would be fun, he thought. When do you want to do this? He asked. Tonight, if you're free, I'd like you to come by about 4.30 or 5 o'clock this evening so I can feed you dinner first and get everything set up. You're on, Mike said. I'll see you this evening. A bit later, he got another call, this time from Amy. Mike, she sobbed. I got served with divorce papers today. Can't we work through this? I told you it was only the one time, and it was an accident. Mike laughed. You stupid witch, he growled. I happen to know that it was much more than a one-time thing. Just sign the papers and it'll be over in a month. Otherwise, it may get very public, and you don't want that. Damn you, she said, her tone changing. I'll fight you every step of the way. I'll take your house and everything you own. I don't think so, witch. Call my lawyer, then sign the papers. He hung up and blocked her number. That afternoon, he went to Linda's house and parked in the middle of their driveway just as she suggested. He knocked on the door, and she opened it wearing a short, ripped t-shirt and a tiny pair of ripped Daisy Duke shorts that showed off her bum. She wrapped her arms around Mike and kissed him deeply while grinding her crotch into his. Like what you see, soldier? She asked seductively. God, yes, you're beautiful. John was an idiot for cheating on you. Yes, he was, and he's going to find out just how big of an idiot he was. Come on in. I have dinner cooked up. Mike entered the house and smelled chicken fried steak. His mouth watered as he thought about what was about to happen. This is delicious, Mike said as he finished the meal she dished out to him. Just wait till we have dessert, she said. Grabbing his hand, she took him upstairs. Linda had placed a chair in the bedroom position just right and put Mike behind the door. She had a pile of zip ties and a couple rolls of duct tape on the dresser. After they went over their plan, they heard the front door open. Linda put her finger over her mouth. I'm home, John shouted from the front room. Whose truck is that in the driveway? I can't get in the garage. I'm sorry, Han. I asked Mike Johnson to come over and give me a hand with something that broke, and I didn't want to bother you at work. Could you please come upstairs? We could use your help. Mike Johnson, he asked as he came up the stairs. Why did you call him? Oh, no reason, really, I just thought he could help. You don't mind, do you? She asked. No. 
I guess not, he said, following her into the bedroom. As soon as he entered the room, Mike slammed the door shut and punched him in the throat. He followed that up with a punch to the gut. John didn't know what hit him, and by the time he could react, Mike and Linda had him in the chair and zip-tied to the legs. His arms were also zip-tied to the chair. What the hell is going on? He yelled when he was able to catch his breath. Linda stood in front of him, her hands on her hips. I learned that you and your buddies have been screwing around with Amy Johnson for the last two years or more, a whole. I also know all about your attack on Mike at the bar the other night. So, I decided to get some revenge. She tore off her top and held her breast for him. Like this, she asked. Well, guess what? You're never touching them again. Please, Linda, don't do this, John begged. Shut up, a-hole. I'm just getting started. She kicked off her tennis shoes, then pulled her shorts down and kicked them off. Linda, no, don't, John begged, shaking his head. Why not? A-hole, she asked. You've been screwing around on me for years while I've been taking care of your bum, cleaning the house, washing your dirty laundry and cooking for you, while working a part-time job. All that time, I've been faithful to you, and this is how you repay me? Screw you. You're going to sit there and watch me get drilled. Then you're out of here. Don't make me tape your mouth shut. John looked down at the floor, defeated. Linda turned to Mike and practically ripped his clothes off. After she took his trousers off, Mike looked down at her, uncertain. She had never seen a man with a prosthetic leg before. She ran her hands over it for a couple of minutes before looking up at him. If it bothers you, we don't have to do this, he said. Linda smiled up at him and pulled down his boxers in response. You may be missing part of a leg, but you're more of a man than that a-hole will ever be, she said, glancing at John. She kissed Mike and proceeded to have sex with him. Oh God, that feels so good, she moaned as she rode him to another orgasm. That's it, she said. Linda got off the bed and didn't bother cleaning herself up. She grabbed an envelope out of her nightstand drawer and dropped it in John's lap as Mike cut the zip ties. You've been served, a-hole. Now get your shit and get out of here. I've already got it packed up for you. There's also a restraining order and you'd better obey it otherwise I'll have you thrown in jail. Got it. John nodded his head quietly and took his duffel bag and the suitcase Linda had prepared. Defeated, he left the house. After John left, Linda buried her head in Mike's shoulder and cried. He held her, kissing her head. It'll be all right, he said. She nodded her head. It won't be easy, but I'll manage. I've already split our accounts and with my job I'll be able to cover the bills for a little while, but I'm eventually going to have to sell the house. Linda, if it comes to that, you can come stay with me, Mike said. She nodded her head. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate that. Please, stay here with me tonight, she begged. Mike agreed, and the two made love well into the morning. Things didn't go well with the divorce at first. Amy decided to fight it, claiming that her six-man gangbang was just a one-time thing. After a little more than six weeks, Sally called for a conference with Mike, Amy, and her attorney, Bill Green. They gathered in a conference room at Sally's office and Amy's attorney started speaking right away, suggesting the two go to counseling to help Mike get past what he called Amy's one-time mistake. Sally shook her head and stopped Amy's attorney. She pulled out a ream of emails and photos and threw them on the table. Amy and her attorney looked at the pile of paper, shocked. Look, Bill, let's cut through the bullshit, okay? My client has evidence in your client's own words, photos and videos of multiple sex parties with the same six men going back over two years. By our estimate, your client has done this over 100 times while her husband was in Iraq. I've seen your client's sworn response, and I want to warn you that if you persist in this, we'll have no choice but to charge your client with perjury and ask for the maximum sentence of 10 years in prison. Now, if you decide to withdraw your response and have your client sign Mr. Johnson's initial proposal, we'll forget about the perjury. What'll it be? Look, Sally, you know as well as I do that it's rare for criminal prosecution for perjury in divorce cases. Your threats won't work here. Do you really want to take that chance, Bill? Sally asked. It may be rare, but it does happen. And with the proof we have, I think a judge would see it our way. Bill shook his head. Mike leaned to Sally and whispered something in her ear. She nodded her head before speaking. Why don't we do this? My client says he'd like to speak with Amy for a few minutes alone. He assures me he won't get out of line. I suggest we let them have this time to work things out. Bill listened as Amy spoke to him quietly. After she finished, he nodded his head. Okay, but we'll be right outside the door. After they left, Amy looked at Mike. All right, what are you planning? She said defiantly. Mike picked up the pile of emails and photos and began throwing the photos in front of her. 
Her eyes widened as he did so. Then he pulled out a photo of her from his wallet. Do you know what got me through those two tours in Iraq? He asked. He pointed at his photo, now yellow with age. It had been taken shortly before he enlisted. This. And then when I didn't hear anything from you, I began thinking the worst. I honestly thought you had gotten hurt or worse. Then when I came home and find you banging those six A-holes, I nearly lost it. You can imagine how I felt when I looked in your email and found all this. You might as well have put a bullet in my head. At least that would have been more merciful. Amy began tearing up as he talked. But he wasn't finished. He tossed out an email he had printed. He began reading the thread. Hey, babes, did you get that little problem taken care of? He looked at her. Then you answered, Yes, I went to the abortion clinic yesterday. I should be okay for next week's party. He looked at her with hate in his eyes. You had an abortion, Amy. Why? Why did you do it? Amy. Was I not man enough for you? He asked. She shook her head. Yes, you were, she said through her tears. I just missed you so much, and then when I met the guys at the club, they made me feel good, and I forgot about how much I missed you. Well, you just screwed up seven families counting ours. Do you know that? He asked. You didn't just screw up our family. You destroyed theirs as well. Some of those guys had children. Did you know that? She shook her head. No, I didn't, she said. What did you think was going to happen when I got back? Clap my hands and brag about big a 304 you are, he asked. She was sobbing by now. I'm sorry, she said through her tears. I didn't mean to hurt you. Well, you did. Look, I happen to know the girls in your office hate your guts and hate what you did. I also know the six A-holes are all getting divorced and are facing discharge from the army. I happen to know they're all going to be getting other than honorable discharges, which is something that'll follow them their entire lives. On top of that, there's six very pissed off wives out there who also hate your guts. He put the papers back in a stack before looking at her. You know damn good and well Sally will pursue formal charges of perjury against you. In this state, you can get up to 10 years in prison for that. And you'll probably never work in a law firm again. Even if you do get off easy, you'll probably have to spend the rest of your life looking over your shoulder. Believe me, those wives are very angry with you right now and would probably love to do to you what was done to their husbands. She looked at him in shock. What are you saying, Mike? She asked. Are you threatening me? Did you have something to do with those guys getting mugged? No, the only one I put down was that a-hole John when he wanted to rub it in my face. And that was after he took a swing at me. I'm not threatening you at all, just letting you know the lay of the land. Look, just sign the papers and end this, now. Can we ever be friends? She asked. Mike shook his head. I don't think so, after what you've done. It'll be a long time before I can stand to be around you. She wiped her eyes after he spoke. She looked down, defeated. Okay, she said quietly. Mike got up and opened the door, letting the lawyers back in. Well, have we come to an agreement? Bill asked. Amy nodded her head. She looked at Sally. I've decided that I don't want any spousal support. Mike only gets a small pension from the army and he needs that. I make enough to support myself. I just want to finish this. Mike was shocked. He wasn't expecting this. Sally nodded her head. Okay, let me make this one change, and I'll need you to initial it. Bill looked at Amy, surprised. Are you sure about this? He asked. Did he threaten you with something? No, Bill. I just want this over with. Sally came back with the amended paperwork and an assistant who happened to be a notary. Mike and Amy signed every place they were told to. She began sobbing when she signed the line that said she had to revert to her maiden name. After they were finished, Mike held out his hand. Tearfully, Amy took off her rings and handed them to him. He took off his wedding ring and handed it to her. Maybe you can be faithful to the next man you decide to marry. There's still a few of your things at the house. If you want, I'll bring them by Saturday. That would be fine. Thanks. Sally and Bill stood up and shook hands. I'll withdraw my client's response and meet you at the courthouse to file this today. Sally nodded her head. I'll see you there, she said. Bill and Amy left the room and Mike collapsed in his chair happy that it was finally over. Sally looked at him for a moment. What did you tell her? Really? She asked. Mike looked at her. I just reminded her of the truth and of the consequences of her actions. There's seven families destroyed because of this. That's why I never represent cheaters. You're a good man, Mike Johnson. You'll do well. Just stay out of trouble, okay? He smiled. I will, Sally. Thanks. He left the office and headed home, stopping on the way to grab a six-pack of beer. He called Linda's cell and gave her the news. Come on by the house tonight, soldier, and I'll help you celebrate. You got it, babe, he said, smiling.
That Saturday, Mike loaded up the few things he had left of Amy's and headed for her sister's apartment, where she had been staying. Julie answered the door when Mike rang the bell. Hi, Mike, she said. I brought the rest of Amy's things over, he said. Well, the next time I see her, I'll get an address and send it, she said. What do you mean? Amy left. She quit her job the day you guys signed your papers, and she left that night. Just packed up her stuff and took off. I don't know where she's going, but I think she's leaving the state. Okay, well, if you talk to her, tell her I dropped this off. Julie took what Mike brought over and thanked him. A few weeks later, Julie told Mike that Amy had fled clear across the country and was now living somewhere in Washington or Oregon. The six men she cheated with were all given discharges that were other than honorable. They also fled the area to parts unknown. Mike wondered if they hooked back up with Amy, but he really didn't care. He married Linda shortly after their divorces were final. It turned out that she got pregnant the night they got revenge on John. They've since had two more children and are doing well. Mike was offered a job as a researcher for something called the Homefront Security Task Force and still works there. The pay is good, the benefits are great, and he has access to information most people would kill for. Better yet, he's able to work from home but sometimes has to fly to someplace called Fort Apache. He was looking through the day's mail and opened a thick envelope when his work phone rang. Mike Johnson, he said, answering the call. Hey Mike, this is Oscar. How are things going? The man at the other end asked. Going great. Oscar, how about you? Mike asked. Living the dream, Oscar said. Hey, I just wanted to thank you for your work on the Skaggs case. It was invaluable. Thanks. Look, I know accolades in this business are few and far between, but Bill wanted me to make sure you got those tickets to Cancun. I just got them today. Good. I'll let Bill know. Make sure you and that pretty wife of yours have a good time. You hear? Mike smiled. Oh yeah, he said. We will. Thanks again. He hung up the phone and looked at the tickets. Talk about perfect timing. Their anniversary was coming up, and he was looking forward to seeing his wife in her new bikini on the beach. Oh yes, he thought, they would indeed have a good time. Dear listeners, please share your thoughts in the comments section below, and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.